This is John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at the Institute of Politics. My name is Peter Jones, and I'm a sophomore at the college studying government in Spanish. And additionally, I'm a student member of the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum Committee. Now, before we begin, please take a moment to note the exits nearest to you, both on the park side and on the JFK Street side. Uh, in the event of an emergency, please walk to the exit nearest to you and congregate in JFK Park. Also, uh, if you wouldn't mind to take a moment now to silence your cell phones, and please join me in welcoming IOP Resident Fellow for the spring of 2023, Quentin Folks. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, it is an honor for me to be here in the forum again, uh, but only briefly. You guys are going to get to the main attraction very quickly. Uh, but tonight's uh, forum will be moderated by Seti Warren uh, and Naomi Corvette, who's an undergraduate student um, here at Harvard. Uh, so I know you guys have been looking forward to the conversation. I know Governor Pritzker is excited about it. Uh, my job tonight is to introduce the governor. Um, you know, it's really cool moment for me personally, uh, being able to bring the governor here as well as my mentor, the governor's chief of staff and his uh, campaign manager from 2017-2018, Ann Caprera. Uh, but Governor Pritzker is the 43rd governor of Illinois, uh, newly reelected uh, last November. Uh, he uh, is a man of great integrity. He's put a lot of faith in me uh, at a very, very young age, which is part of the reason why I'm even on this stage with you all here tonight. Uh, but with that, uh, I'm just going to hand it over to them, and they have an excellent conversation set up for you guys. So thank you for coming. Well, maybe I should begin by saying that I grew up in a household where both my parents were involved in politics in one fashion or another. My mother was a democratic activist, a, a pro-choice, pro-LGBTQ rights activist. Uh, and this is in the 70s when it was, when it was uh, maybe even more challenging and you were in a, a, a smaller minority of people who believed in uh, those issues. And so I, I knew what it was to activate on behalf of policy that you cared about. Um, I was a kid uh, following my mother around to every march, every uh, meeting, everything that she was engaged in. Uh, and my father had been the finance chair for a number of Democrats who ran for public office, for Congress, for Senate. Uh, so that was the kind of, you know, uh, household I was in. Uh, and then fast forward, you said it was, you know, the, I had not been in politics before, but actually I went to uh, college, didn't come to Harvard, didn't get into Harvard, I might have. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I, I um, went to Duke, um, the, I know th this is the Duke of the North here. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, loved it, but I uh, had, been engaged in public policy, studying uh, political science at Duke, and the president of Duke University was the former governor of North Carolina, a guy named Terry Sanford, and he's the guy who in the 60s integrated the schools. He was the first Southern governor to integrate the schools. That's a big deal. You risk your political career to do that in the 1960s, and indeed, he couldn't have been elected dog catcher when he was done integrating the schools. But he was a hero to many of us to, who believe that public service is about making real change and risking something in order to make that change. And so, uh, so I've been engaged in, in uh, public policy really ever since I worked on his campaign for United States Senate. Remember, he was, not, he was 70 years old and they recruited him to run for United States Senate in North Carolina and all the old racist tropes came out uh, against him 
uh, by the Republicans, and he won anyway. And then I got, I was his advance man on his campaign, and I got hired to go to Washington to be a legislative assistant, in fact, the youngest legislative assistant in the U.S. Senate at the time, uh, because he really cared and, you know, uh, elevated a lot of young people. Um, and one day walked into his office and said, you know, if I wanted to run for public office someday, what would I do? And he said, do you want to run in North Carolina? And I said, probably not. <laughs> uh, and he said, well, then you should make sure that you, you know, go back to wherever it is that you're going to live and um, go to school there if you're going to go to law school, which I wanted to do and did, uh, and, you know, get involved in politics there. And so I did. And... Um, and I guess the rest is history. I ran for, for United States Congress in 1998 uh, against now my congresswoman uh, and a great ally of mine, Jan Schakowsky. Uh, and, um, and she supported me when I ran for governor. That's great. Um, governor, Chicago has a new mayor, as you know. Um, first part of this question is how do you intend to work with him Mm -hmm. And the second part has to do with the gun violence that has plagued Chicago for many, many years. Um, how do you think about solving that problem with the new mayor? Well, let's start with the new mayor, uh, a terrific, I would say, young uh, new mayor, although he's 47, a lot younger than I am. Um, and he is somebody who's been involved in politics for a long time, uh, understands how to get things done. Uh, and I know it's my job as governor to lift up. This is, you know, 20% of the population of the state is in Chicago. Uh, it's also the Chicagoland area is 60 or 70% of the economy of the state of Illinois. So success for Chicago means success for the state. Um, we also need the rest of the state to succeed. And uh, so the new mayor, you know, my job is to work well with him. That's why I didn't endorse anybody in the mayoral election. Uh, I, you know, I may have opinions about things and, you know, share them privately with my family. But, uh, but it was important to me that whoever wins, that I was going to be their, their ally in getting things done for the city. One of the challenges, and there are a number, but one of the challenges that uh, we seek to overcome in Chicago, of course, is gun violence. And uh, it's something that I've taken seriously as governor. Uh, I created the office, of, uh, uh, the office addressing gun violence in our state and uh, appointed a leader who had come out of the uh, violence prevention world. Um, he had run organizations on the ground in Chicago uh, uh, his name is Chris Patterson, and these are organizations that uh, engage young people in jobs uh, rather than in violence, um, engage uh, the communities in fighting against or standing against gangs, preventing people from joining gangs, and so on. Very successful organizations, and I had already had a very strong affiliation and belief in those organizations. That is an important, what I will describe as a near-term but medium-term solution to gun violence. I, I, it shouldn't be forgotten, because we can all talk about you know, banning assault weapons, which I did uh, in the state of Illinois. Um, and we ought to be doing that nationally. But, uh, and, and we also banned switches, which turn a gun into an automatic weapon. Uh, and we uh, banned high capacity magazines. So we ought to be doing all that nationally, but we just did that in January. And by the way, it's all tied up in courts right now and we'll see, you know, could end up at the Supreme Court. Um, uh, but eight other states have passed uh, uh, automatic weapons bans. Uh, look, I believe that you have to address it short, medium and long term. The long-term solutions are addressing poverty in communities all across the state, and particularly in the city of Chicago. Brandon Johnson believes that too, that we've got to address poverty, we've got to lift people up who've been left out and left behind. Um, again, I've been in office for four years longer than, uh, well, he was a county commissioner, but he's now mayor and I've been a governor for four years already. We've been working on these things, but you know, I believe that we will be great partners in addressing short, medium, and long-term solutions to gun violence. Great, thank you. 
Um, so you've passed two significant pieces of legislation, one around climate, one around infrastructure, among many other accomplishments. I'm wondering how has progressive governing in the Midwest affected your success, considering there's a very diverse political landscape in Illinois? Um, when you said I, that I had passed two major pieces of legislation, I thought, what about the rest? <laughs> I, we ra I mean, first thing I passed was raising the minimum wage of $15, which had been at $8.25 an hour, um, and, uh, and, and, and legalizing cannabis in the state of Illinois, um, and a few other things. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but addressing the two that you just raised, look, uh, uh, we, all of us, all of us need to be engaged in fighting climate change um, and doing it in whatever way we can. And in the state of Illinois, we have, uh, we had an interesting opportunity. Um, we have the largest nuclear fleet of any state in the United States. Um, now, whatever your belief is about nuclear uh, power, what you should know is that uh, in the process of transition from fossil fuel uh, to, you know, to a world without fossil fuel and clean energy, um, having a nuclear fleet that is providing 52% of the power to the state is a pretty great advantage, and we need to rely upon that. Now, some of them are uh, older uh, plants and are less profitable or unprofitable, maybe. Uh, and so that's a negotiation between the state and the uh, energy provider. In this case, it was Exelon. Uh, and trying to figure out, you know, how to keep those plants open and also make sure that we're not taking, uh, getting taken advantage of by a major corporation asking us for a lot of money from the state to keep them open. So uh, unlike my predecessor, where they uh, signed a bill, sent a bunch of money to uh, the uh, uh, energy provider and, uh, and the taxpayers paid, uh, we actually did an audit of those power plants and discovered that we could do it for a sixth of the price uh, and keep those plants open, and we did. Um, so that was a big change. So we are on track now in Illinois and have a law in place that will eliminate fossil fuel energy production by 2050. And that means no coal plants. That means you know we're reducing and eliminating natural gas plants. Uh, and we are significantly increasing wind, solar, and relying upon nuclear, and even looking now at uh, removing the ban on nuclear, not to build any major new plants, but there's small nuclear reactors that are being developed now that are much safer, that could be used uh, in places in Illinois where there's a, a lack of, of energy production. Uh, so those are, that's something I'm very proud of. It, it's changed the direction. We're the only Midwestern state that's done something this massive. Um, and indeed, it's, it's game changing, I think, nationally. Uh, so proud of the work that we did on that. Just as a follow on to that question, um, can you just speak to the politics of the state house there in Illinois? The what? The politics that, that are there. Uh, you being a Democrat, you've you know, identified yourself as a progressive Democrat in this Midwestern state. Um, talk about how you navigate it and how you work the politics there. You keep drilling in on the progressive uh, label, and you know what? I'm okay with that. Um, but I just want to maybe modify it and say I would describe myself as a pragmatic progressive. Remember, I came uh, into the governorship when we had massive budget deficits in the state brought on by a Republican governor who refused to work with Democrats to balance the budget. And so we had $17 billion of uh, overdue bills. We had uh, the worst credit rating in the nation. Uh, we had dropped eight credit downgrades uh, during his term in office. And there were people telling me when I ran for office that Illinois couldn't be saved fiscally and that I shouldn't even run because we're gonna have to declare bankruptcy so it'll be an utter and complete failure. So, Welcome to the governorship, and <laughs> uh, and uh, and so uh, you know you have to solve for a balanced budget before you can make sure that you're addressing your progressive ideals, right, and the things that you believe in. Forget the word progressive for a second. Just remember, we're solving problems for people, right? That is the job of government, and it's maybe in what you think. Uh, 
you know, are the problems that government should solve. Maybe that's the difference between a, you know, a, a progressive liberal and a conservative. Um, but uh, to me anyway, uh, the, the starting with the focus on people who have too often been left out and left behind, that starts with, you know, black and brown people. It starts with people who live in rural America, uh, white, brown, black, uh, who live in rural America, who often just get forgotten. And indeed, under Republican governors, too, um, uh, th they've been forgotten. And so I came into office with a real focus on, like, we need to lift them up. We need to lift up the workers of Illinois and the working families of Illinois. And that means standing up for, you know, their right to collectively bargain. Um, so, you know, again, the, the the, how do you come in and govern in, a, you know, in the way that I have? I think it's tell people what you believe, get elected on it, and then do it. And don't compromise on the things that really matter to people's lives, right? We've got to make sure you health care, sending your kids to a good school, uh, allowing people to afford to go to college. College affordability in Illinois was, uh, had been, I don't know, made extraordinarily difficult. Um, and so we've turned a lot of those things around. And let me add one more thing that matters a lot to me. I, for 20 years before I was governor, I was involved, I had still involved in early childhood education and uh, child care and essentially everything to do with kids zero to five and trying to uh, help families and help those young children. Uh, if you want to improve your K-12 education system, early childhood education for, K for zero to five. Um, if you want to, you know, uh, focus on workforce development, child care for families with children zero to five. Um, and so uh, I did that on the outside uh, and, and went to see governors and legislators and to, to try to convince them you've got to invest in this. And you'll save money when you do it. You'll save money. It's fiscally responsible to invest in very young children. And uh, I was successful doing that as a private citizen, and, and then I became governor and said, you know, it's great, I get to do this as governor of a state, of a major state in the United States, and when I arrived, the cupboards were bare. Like, there was no money to invest. So, balance the budget, address the, you know, the things that really matter to working families. If we could just stay on the financial question just for a minute, as you alluded to, you know, Illinois just had this terrible run before you became governor of state finances really being troubled and um, very bad shape. Um, how did you turn things around? What were the difficult choices you had to make to make sure the state was on solid ground financially? Uh, you know, again, I think communicating, especially to the General Assembly and the public, uh, communicating why this is important, right? And that, that you can't solve the problems you want to solve unless you're you know, literally addressing the fiscal challenges first. So uh, now, I got a lot done in my first year, and one big thing was passing a budget, which doesn't seem like it should be a hard thing to do, but in Illinois, two years we went without a balance, without any budget, longer than any state ever in the history of the United States because of my predecessor. Um, we got a lot done in my first year, including balancing the budget, and remember I came in 2019, uh, the legislative session ended May 31, uh, and COVID hit March of 2020. So with all the challenges that had taken decades for Illinois to get you know, in the hole about, uh, now all of a sudden we get hit by a deadly global pandemic. And uh, we were the, probably the state least prepared uh, from a fiscal perspective to, to deal with it. We were better off than we had been a year or two earlier, but you know, it was challenging. And so the, the, those... Um, you know, dealing with the fiscal challenges and, you know, trying to overcome COVID at the same time, you know, intensely difficult. We're going to shift to 2024 politics. Feel free to break news if you'd like. <laughs> um, Joe Biden is running for re-election, everybody. <laughs> Did you get that at the press? Um, two questions here. Uh, what do you think the state of the race is? Um, Republican... Democrat, feel free to comment on that. And what's at stake next year, next fall? Your opinion. Um, I'll start with what's at stake. Uh, you know, I, it feels like every two years you hear, and I am saying, and lots of other people are saying, 
this is the most important election of our lifetimes. It, was, it felt like that in 2016 when Donald Trump was elected. It felt like that in 2018 when I was running, but most importantly, there were a lot of people who wanted to stop Donald Trump in his tracks. Um, it felt like that in 2020 when we were facing the possibility of Donald Trump getting reelected. Uh, and, and again, it felt like that in 2022 when everybody talked about the red wave and how that was gonna usher in a new Republican era in the Congress that uh, was going to precede the reelection of Donald Trump to the presidency. So, um, so what's at stake from my perspective? And I am somebody who, not only do I disagree with well, I don't know, almost everything that Donald Trump stands for, um, not only do I disagree with him, but, uh, but I dealt with him on perhaps the most important issue that anybody will ever deal with a president about, and that's on COVID because lives were at stake. And I must tell you that uh, he, he was an, uh, I mean, an absolute and utter and complete failure. And uh, leaving, just telling the states, you know, we're not gonna help you out, good luck. Uh, you know that here in Massachusetts, your Republican governor uh, dealt with the same things that I dealt with uh, as a Democratic governor in Illinois. So uh, just giving that as one consequence, you know, having somebody who does not know how to lead or uses the office to, for political uh, purposes uh, and not to literally save lives uh, is, you know, is what's at stake. That's an example. We need leaders. And I think that uh, Joe Biden has demonstrated from the moment that he took office that he understood what the stakes were. Um, that you know, from the minute he took office, he went about distributing vaccines. He went about making sure that the states were able to put their economies back together. That uh, that you know, we as a country are one unified country. He he has stood for that since he took office. He is not somebody, and I think if you look throughout his uh, history, right, he's somebody who works across the aisle, and he demonstrated that and got some of the most important legislation passed, you know, perhaps in the last 20 years, uh, just in the first two years in office. So uh, in my opinion, you know, just not looking at all the terrible things about some of the candidates on the other side, uh, I would just say that, uh, that Joe Biden brings two things to the job that he's demonstrated already, which is he gets big things done, especially for working families and people who've gotten left out. Um, and second, he's probably the most empathetic, empathic person that has ever held the office, or at least the, in my lifetime. Uh, that is his superpower. The man has empathy to his core. Um, and I've felt it personally uh, with him, and I also feel it uh, in the way he leads. Thank you. I'm going to hand things back over to Naomi. Before I do that, uh, we can begin uh, lining up for questions. Uh, there are four microphones, two on the floor, one there, one there, and then two in the loge boxes uh, up there. Um, and we'll get to your questions just in just a couple of minutes. Yes, so Governor, as a young person from Illinois myself, I think I and probably many of my classmates in the audience are very concerned by some of the significant issues facing our generation that weren't necessarily present for generations before us, um, you know, from climate to um, the cost of living to education. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about what you're doing to set up young adults from Illinois for success. I, you know, I really believe that, um, it's probably a West Wing episode, I think, uh, in which there's a bar scene where the, uh, the uh, advisors to the president are stuck in an Iowa town uh, and they, they, they go to a bar, does anybody remember this? Uh, and there's a guy sitting at the bar who is talking about how difficult it is to pay for his child's college education uh, and to get by and you know, pay his mortgage and so on, right? And, 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 and he says to them, I just wish somebody would make it just a little bit easier, just a little bit easier for me to you know, to, to, to get by just a little bit. And I, I think about that a lot because, it, you know, we, we need to make it a lot easier, but even if we just made it a little bit easier for everybody, 
And so when you talk about, you know, as a young person, what, what matters? You know, just a little bit easier to pay for and afford college, to not be strapped with debt for the rest of your life. Um, make it a little bit easier to, you know, to buy a home, uh, to get a job uh, that pays a wage that you can actually afford to live on. Um, and then ultimately to raise a family. Um, th those, I think about those things all the time, the kitchen table issues, right? How do we just make it a little bit, and if you can make it a little bit easier in each one of these categories, in each one of these areas, you make it a lot easier for people. And that's what I think that we ought to be delivering for the next generation. Great, thank you. We're gonna start uh, with questions. If you just uh, say or state your affiliation, um, and your name, and remember, uh, a question ends with a question. So I'll start over here. <laughs> Hi, Governor. Thank you so much for coming to speak Where to Harvard today. Over there. Ah, there you are. <laughs> um, my question for you is about the fact that since you've been, you know, a fairly successful state executive so far, won re-election, <laughs> has good approval ratings, you know, passed the budget. What what do you see in the federal government that maybe you would like to change if you were like maybe the president or something like that? What do you think maybe not? <laughs> may, what do you think Biden could do better? What do you think should be different about our government to for you know the president to be as successful as you when it comes to getting things done? Uh, well, there are a lot of things that I would want the federal government to do that it isn't doing, and in part, those are things they're not doing because of politics, right? Um, so we need a, I talked about earlier, we need a federal assault weapons ban. Why isn't that happening? Why has that not happened already? We just had two mass shootings. But, you know, that's just two after, I mean, and those are two mass shootings in schools. We have dozens and dozens. Uh, that are happening all the time. And um, uh, so I, I, but what do I think about, um, when I think about the federal government, it is like it's stymied. It is not getting done the things that really protect people, right? And I, I, that is politics. It's about, in the end, how do you break through all that? We have to win. We, meaning, you know, Democrats, uh, have to win. Uh, in order to get things done, we have to win, and uh, that's that means you know uh, if we win at the federal level, if we win the presidency, continue to control the presidency and win the Congress, right? We can prevent things like you know mifeprestone from being uh, made illegal uh, by a judge because we get to appoint the judges, um, and it, 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 you know how do we address? Uh, protecting a woman's right to choose. Let's pass a federal law that protects a woman's right to choose. But, but none of those things, that it's, maybe I make it sound easy. I know it's not easy, but we have to win in order to get it done. That's why you know, campaigns matter. It's why politics matter. It's why I was engaged in the 2022 elections outside of Illinois, because we needed Tony Evers to win in Wisconsin. We needed uh, the, you know, Janet uh, Prasewitz, I think I said her name right, uh, to win in the Supreme Court race in 2023, and she did, um, in Wisconsin. Uh, we needed Gretchen Whitmer to win. We needed Tony Eve, I mean, sorry, uh, Tim Walls in Minnesota to win. I mean, we have to, and we have to go win in the Congress, in the, in the House, in the Senate, and I don't know how to say it in any other way. There's no other way to break through. What would I change about the federal government? We have to win in order to get the policies in place that we believe in. Thank you. Go up here. Hi, my name is Alma. I'm with the college. Um, I'm just wondering why during like your campaign against Darren Bailey, 24 million was given to support his um, advertisements. Um, I just don't know if this is a common occurrence of like the Democratic Party giving money to the GOP, but if you could just talk on that. So I think what you're referring to is that the Democratic Governors Association ran ads during the Republican primary. Uh, and uh, let me back up and just give you a picture of what was going on in, in Illinois at the time. Uh, there, was a, there was a wealthy hedge fund uh, uh, founder who 
wrote a $50 million check to a candidate in the Republican primary. Um, be, no one else had money like that in the Republican primary and uh, said that he was doing it because he wanted to beat me and was willing to write a 200 to $300 million check in a general election to defeat me. Why? Because I wanted a graduated income tax. He didn't want a graduated income tax. We weren't able to get that done because of his opposition, and he wanted to punish me and make sure I never had a chance to make the tax system fairer again in office. Uh, and so the Democratic Governors Association, which I've been a supporter of for years, um, came in and supported a different candidate uh, in that Republican primary. But it really wasn't that. It was that they ran ads saying uh, the things that Republican primary voters believed. The, the ads, here's what the ads said. Darren Bailey wants to end abortion rights. That was true. Darren Bailey wants to uh, uh, preserve gun rights and believes in your Second Amendment rights with no limitations. And that was true. Uh, and that uh, Darren Bailey is uh, too conservative uh, for Illinois. And Republican voters aren't stupid. They voted for the person that believed in the things that they wanted to come out of the Republican primary. That's how Darren Bailey won. So, I mean, it was an unusual situation, but I want to remind everybody that when I ran four years earlier, the Republicans did virtually the same thing to me in the Democratic primary. Uh, they attacked me. The Republican governor did not want me to make it through the Democratic primary in 2018 because he knew I was the strongest candidate to beat him in the general election. So, yeah, politics is tough. We'll go over here. Hi, my name is Rachel and I'm a second year Masters of Public Policy student from Highland Park, Illinois. I'm also an organizer with March for Our Lives. Thank you so much for all of your work to pass the Protect Illinois Communities Act. I know you've talked publicly about the importance of a federal assault weapons ban, but given that it may be politically difficult, I'm curious what advice and leadership lessons you would have for other governors and states who may want to pass an assault weapons ban, given how important your support was to getting the Protect Illinois Communities Act passed in Illinois? We won on the issue of banning assault weapons uh, and switches and high capacity magazines because activists got Democrats who believe in that elected. That's why we won including me, but also members of the General Assembly. And everywhere along the way to convince the members of the General Assembly to vote for it, there were activists wearing Moms Demand Action. You know, I mean, the, the, there, there were every kind of organization that was standing up for protecting public safety uh, were there uh, bolstering people who would stand up uh, to protect communities from gun violence. And uh, that's the, that's, there's no trick to it. It is literally on the ground activism by people. It, it isn't like, you know, well, if you just elect the right person in the right position, yes, that's one thing, but that only happens if people are out there knocking doors and making sure that the public understands how vitally important it is. That's how we got that done. And I was surrounded by, when I signed that bill, banning assault weapons. I was surrounded by those activists because they're the ones who made that happen. Go down there. Um, Paul Tumanoro, I'm here from Chicago and I am getting a master's of business at HES and um, also have you to- You couldn't get into University of Chicago Northwestern Business School? Uh, <laughs> and uh, must confess that I did act as your data chair before you started your campaign in 98 and was convinced to go with Howard Carroll. <laughs> um, I'd like to um, get your thoughts and know if maybe Illinois is starting to have some sort of working group um, on artificial intelligence to, like you said, maybe make things not just a little bit easier but a lot easier for the machinery of government to, um, to service the people of Illinois. So we have a department called the Department of Innovation and Technology. 
uh, in Illinois, and it, essentially the, that's where our chief technology officer resides in the department that oversees all the technology for government. Uh, and within that department, two things are happening. One is a look at how we can use artificial intelligence to uh, speed up and improve services uh, for people across the state uh, to make sure that we're using our systems properly to kind of upgrade the delivery of services. But also the answer, trying to answer the question, what are the dangers? Um, and you know, artificial intelligence has huge advantages, there's no doubt about it. But as I think we're all talking about these days, you can see how it can be misused. Uh, so uh, these are things that I think the federal government needs to be uh, extraordinarily engaged in. State governments can do what we can do, but we're not in the business of protecting the nation. Um, from the attack of artificial intelligence from both within the nation and outside. Uh, but I think we all need to be on guard um, uh, about artificial intelligence. And uh, at the same time, I, I very much want to make sure that we're utilizing the best features of it uh, safely within government to deliver services for people. Yeah. Hi, Governor. Thanks for being here. My name Thank is you. Dylan. I'm a first year law student and I'm from Buffalo Grove, Illinois. Um, one of the reasons I think I was able to come to Harvard is that I had the privilege of going to Stevenson High School in Lincolnshire, which as you may know, is one of the most obscenely overfunded public schools in the country. Um, given the contrast between that and a lot of the rural schools downstate and urban schools in Chicago and how they are struggling with funding. I was wondering if you think there's any appetite in Springfield for any redistributive policies or do you think even that might be too far field for the current like state of politics? Well, back in 2017, as you may know, the General Assembly in Illinois passed something called evidence-based funding. It's a model uh, for funding that was vastly different than it had been in the, you know, in the decades, indeed, centuries before. Um, and the, uh, the, the basis of it was um, essentially setting adequacy scores for schools. How well is a school serving the needs of its children? How are those children doing uh, in school? And then determining some of the funding uh, that would go to schools based upon that. It has helped measurably. I wanted to say immeasurably, but it's measured. Uh, and it, it has genuinely made a difference. Indeed, a study just came out months ago uh, showing the difference that evidence-based funding is making. Yeah, we've got schools uh, that are vastly more funded than others. I'll just give the, you know, the, probably the polar opposites are, let's say, Lake Forest and East St. Louis, Illinois. Um, and I bet it's a multiple three times or more that's being spent on a kid in Lake Forest than is being spent on Evans, I mean, on uh, in East St. Louis. It's unfair. And so this evidence-based funding model is pushing dollars towards schools that are still trying to reach uh, uh, appropriate adequ adequacy levels. Um, I want to just say, though, that we're doing a whole bunch of things other than evidence-based funding to try to address this. Here's one example. We have a teacher shortage in Illinois. I think this is true in every state right now. Um, we have a teacher shortage. And what we've done is, what I did in the current budget is set aside uh, $70 million that's focused on the 170 school districts that are least adequately funded uh, that most need uh, teachers. And, um, and in fact, that's where 80% of the teacher shortage resides. That's just to give you an idea, it's about a fifth of all the schools, about 20% of our schools are where 80% of the vacancies are. Um, and so that's another way to address that inequity. Uh, last thing is I, I fought like heck and put my own money behind it uh, and ran a campaign uh, to pass a graduate income tax in the state of Illinois that I believe would help us fund schools properly. It would reduce property taxes and properly fund schools that are underfunded. Um, I didn't succeed. We had to pass a constitutional amendment. It needed to pass with 60% of the vote. We were unable to get the 60%. Um, I, I still believe in, in a graduated income tax. I still believe in uh, 
uh, making sure that we have a tax system that's fair and that, that you use the word redistributive, but importantly, that every child, no matter what zip code they live in, gets a good education, a good public education. And we're working at that every day, but it's not going to be as easy as it would have been had we had a graduate income tax. Great. There. Hi, Governor. Uh, my name is Andy. I'm a senior at the college from Naperville. I actually want to touch on the topics of money and spending in uh, campaigns. As we all know, Ken Griffin spent $56 million on against the fair tax. You put in $54 million of your own money. Uh, on your own campaigns, you spent over $100 million bankrolling your campaigns. Ken Griffin has now said he'll basically give a blank check to Ron DeSantis. I'm wondering if you're worried about the rise of money, uh, just big money in politics in Illinois and across the US, especially as someone who arguably has benefited a lot from that money yourself. Yes, and the answer is we need campaign finance reform, both in Illinois and nationally. Um, and uh, to be honest with you, I, I, you know, Paul Simon, who was a big believer in campaign finance reform and our former senator, um, uh, was somebody who famously said about political action committees, uh, you know, when someone said, well, why are you accepting PAC money when you're opposed to political action committees? And he said, because we can't unilaterally disarm in the process of, you know, let, we can't let the other side essentially have the entire field uh, while we're trying to do the right thing and get campaign finance reform passed. Um, when I came into office, sorry, when I was running for office, the incumbent governor was somebody who also had bankrolled, as you use that term, his own campaign. He funded his own campaign. He got $20 million from Ken Griffin also, but also funded his own campaign with, I think, $50 million uh, and uh, ran against a Democrat who didn't have that kind of backing and uh, he outspent him two to one. Uh, this, and he turned out to be, I think, one of the worst governors our state's ever had. Um, and so when 20, uh, when 2018 rolled around, it was important to be able to compete. And he was running for re-election. And so I felt like I'm not going to unilaterally disarm. Democrats shouldn't unilaterally disarm. And, um, you know, and I guess I could have, you know, there are choices to make. I've supported candidates, uh, you know, with my uh, resources. But uh, I also felt like uh, I could beat this guy. And I felt like there were changes that needed to be made, and particularly in the fiscal issues facing the state. Uh, that I could help bring about. Uh, so yeah, I spent my own resources on it. Do I think that the, the, uh, self-funding campaigns are the answer to politics? No, absolutely not. And I believe that we ought to change it. I do not know in the current environment how we do that because the Supreme Court of the United States essentially has said that it's free speech to spend as much money as you want. I would like us to change the way we fund campaigns um, and I don't want to unilaterally disarm while we're doing it. Just staying on that, Governor, um, what does campaign finance reform look like to you specifically? Are there some specific well, um, I'm, I'm old enough to, I'm sorry to interrupt. You. No, no, I just wanted to. Yeah, I'm old enough to, uh, hopefully some of you are also to remember um, that there used to actually be, particularly at the federal level, limits on what you could, you know, give to a campaign. And even political action committees, it was 5000 or $10,000, right? A political action committee, individuals, $1,000, um, dating myself now, because I think it's 3000 something now uh, per person. But, um, but, but my point is that, that super PACs didn't exist. Uh, and Citizens United didn't exist. And so we had actual limits. Uh, and I would like to have actual limits. But again, if the other side isn't willing to abide by it, what are we supposed to do? We, we just can't sit back and let them, let Ken Griffin, let uh, Dick Uline, somebody else who wrote a 50 plus million dollar check to my opponent in the general election, um, uh, you know, control the politics of America. I'm supporting candidates all over the United States with my resources. Um, you know, you might think that's good or bad, but I mean, I, it's not just supporting me. Uh, it's about electing Democrats up and down the tickets in every state in the United States. Great, thank you. Go over there. 
Hi, my name is Mary Catherine. I'm from Mount Prospect, Illinois. Um, kind of going off of that last question, actually. So your net worth is $3.6 billion, and you were born into one of the wealthiest families in America. But despite your privileged upbringing, uh, you have been a vocal supporter of policies aimed at increasing taxes on high earners and reducing economic inequality in Illinois. So how do you reconcile any potential conflicts between your personal wealth and your policy proposals? So what personal actions have you taken to ensure that you remain accountable to the average person in Illinois in spite of your affluent background? And what led you to go down a different path from other politicians like the previous governor who uh, may come from a similar financial background but tend to be more economically and socially conservative in their policies? Uh, let me start by saying apparently everybody here at Harvard is from Illinois, which Pretty I much. appreciate. Pretty much. Uh, all That's the right. smartest That's right. people in America. That's right. um, <laughs> Uh, thank you for the question, and I, I know it is. Uh, it, it, it may seem like a contradiction to some people, right, to have somebody who has a lot of money who also believes uh, that we ought to be lifting up people who don't. And um, but I don't think it's a contradiction. I think it's about a matter of values. And I think, and I'm the one who, you know, I'm. I was trying to change the tax system to raise my taxes and to lower taxes on people who are working class and middle class in the state of Illinois, because I think a fairer tax system makes a better society, a better economy, uh, and certainly a better fiscal situation for the state. Um, and honestly, people who are wealthy can afford to pay just a little bit more um, to make sure that we have a government that takes care of people who need government. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I can say that, uh, that this is a matter of values. I, I, it does not matter how much money you have, you know, rich or poor. The, the question you're asking, the answer is it's a matter of values. What do you believe in? How much do you believe? What is the United States founded upon? I do believe that we're a democratic capitalist, you know, country and that there should be moderations on aspects of capitalism because run amok, it is dangerous. But at the same time, people should be motivated, I think, to succeed. And one way to do that is to allow people to get ahead by earning more. Um, but at the same time, people shouldn't be left behind in that process. So that's why we have things like a minimum wage and it's too low. And uh, you know, we need to have policies in place that really are about thinking about the you know, 80% of Americans who uh, are living paycheck to paycheck, uh, and who, for whom you know, a, a, a flat tire it may mean that they lose their job and that they are on the brink of bankruptcy. Um, that, that shouldn't be in the United States, and we can do better than that. Again, a matter of values, and if you see, just list the values that the Democratic Party stands for and the values that the Republican Party stands for, and I'm not saying those are the only parties or the only ways to believe, but I really believe that the Democratic Party has stood up for working people and, and for, for black and brown people and stood up for equity, um, and, and that's why, you know, we, if we can control uh, state and federal governments, um, we will bring a, about a fairer society. That's, I think, what we're trying to do as Democrats. And I, I believe in that, I've believed in that my whole life. You know, years ago they called, uh, you know, sometimes it was if you were on the left, you were a liberal, uh, now you're progressive. Um, and I think it's, a, it's all about, um, you know, lifting up those people who have been forgotten. Hi, Governor. My name is Abhi, and I'm a sophomore at the college from Bloomingdale in DuPage County. Um, <laughs> my father moved to the state 18 years ago and set up a small business. Um, Illinois is really the only home I know, although I was born in California. Um, a lot of people complain, as you know. Um, but when they're really fed up, they vote with their feet, right? And by that metric, last year, 140,000 Illinoisans made the hard decision to get up and leave the state. Among the reasons cited, as you know, are high property taxes, high sales taxes, and as you mentioned, unpopular proposed income taxes, increases in income taxes. So when people like my father and my family are faced with the decision of 
downsizing and selling the family business or leaving the state, what do you have to say to them? Well, let me contend uh, that the data that you just cited is wrong. L let me talk about population in the state of Illinois. So for year after year after year, um, the American Community Survey, which is literally like a poll, a survey that gets done uh, in between the 10 year census that gets done, uh, showed that Illinois was losing population. 100,000 a year, every year, year in, year out, um, or more. And I believed it. I believed it. And I campaigned in part on making sure that we are addressing the out-migration from the state of Illinois. Uh, one of the important things to do, which I have done, is make college more affordable because it turns out that the plurality of people who are leaving are people who couldn't afford to go to college in the state of Illinois. Let's make it affordable. Let's keep our smartest, best you know, kids, uh, or smartest kids in the state in Illinois. So I've effectuated that. Meanwhile, we did a census in 2020. Turns out all the American Community Survey data, wrong. We gained population in the state of Illinois in the census of 2020. So now what am I supposed to say? Every year the Republicans, the right wing, cites the American Community Survey data, you, you just cited some from last year, um, that says that we're losing population when the reality is that we didn't over the last 10 years when the American Community Survey said we did. So uh, I, I would just say our economy has grown from $800 million to over a trillion dollars in the last couple of years. Um, we, are, we have jobs uh, available. In fact, we have about 85,000 more jobs available in the state of Illinois right now than we have you know, uh, uh, people who can fill those jobs. And you might say it's because people left. I would tell you because we have a lot of people who retired early and that's what the data shows in Illinois, because we don't have any retirement tax, one of three or four states that doesn't have a retirement tax. Um, and, uh, and we had people retire early instead of at 65 or, or 67 or 70, they retired at 63 or 62, why? Because of COVID. And they said, you know what, I'm done, I, I can retire now, I don't need to keep working with COVID around. Uh, and we don't have enough young people that are you know, coming up in the next generation to take those jobs. So it, it's a cha that's a challenge. We have a labor shortage all across the United States. Hopefully all of you know that. Um, and that you know, in Illinois anyway, our economy continues to grow. We've created a lot of jobs and I'm gonna continue to work to do that. Even Governor, I'm Bobby Stroop. I'm over, a student over at the law school. I'm not from Illinois. Uh, but I do have a friend. I'm sorry, from, but you're welcome to come to. All right, I'll look at it. I'll look at it. Uh, I got a friend from Chicago though who told me wanted me to ask you this. So, okay. uh, <laughs> actually, it's always some guy who's not here. That they... <laughs> um, given the pushback on the Safety Act um, from prosecutors, police officers, and others, do you think lawmakers pursued an effective communication strategy, or do you think they should have approached it in a different way? And um, if it's banned or if it's overturned, um, what would be the next steps for that act? So I don't know if everybody knows what the Safety Act is, um, but I guess a shorthand description would be uh, we uh, eliminated cash bail in order to keep violent criminals in jail and nonviolent criminals to not keep them in jail just because they owed a few hundred dollars or a thousand dollars of bail money. Um, that's one aspect of it. It's probably the most well-known aspect of the Safety Act. Another part, uh, you know, some other features of it that people don't pay attention to are we're funding police with body cameras, uh, requiring body cams uh, for all the police departments in the state of Illinois. This is good for police officers. It's good for, um, for people that police officers are, are chasing or, or arresting. Um, and there are a lot of other features uh, of the act. Um, all of it designed to improve public safety in the state. But Republicans have made this, you know, in a time when crime has gone up in big cities all across the United States, Republicans made this an issue in the 2022 Election Safety Act, uh, being an example of crime as an issue. Uh, and then they took it to court. They've now filed uh, and are in court, uh, have made 
arguments in front of the Supreme Court of Illinois to try to overturn the Safety Act. Um, communication strategy, I know, is you know, not a policy question, but a political question, and I'll, I'll try to answer that. Um, I think that um, the legislature uh, met for six to eight months. They had working groups meeting with state's attorneys and police and uh, sheriffs and, and uh, you know, every kind of organization that's involved in public safety, including uh, domestic uh, violence victims uh, who also are protected under the Safety Act uh, to a greater degree than ever before. Um, but trying to put together a comprehensive bill for public safety. Uh, that took place over months and months and months. Then, as the legislature was coming to a close in the uh, lame duck session uh, uh, in January of 2021, uh, 2022, uh, 2022, uh, the, they, they, they were literally passing bills, you know, as fast as they could that they knew they had lined up votes for over the, you know, last few days of session, and they happened to pass that bill at about four in the morning. Well, that became an issue too. Well, oh, nobody ever heard of this bill and it just happened at four in the morning. Well, that wasn't true. Months and months and months of meetings with state's attorneys and police and so on. Now, police got and state's attorneys got about 30% of what they wanted included in the bill. Uh, maybe more, 50% of what they wanted included in the bill. And they didn't get other things that they wanted in the bill. And so they decided to oppose it. And it became a political issue. It was all that money that got spent against me by Dick Uline in the general election, by, by uh, 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 Ken Griffin in the primary election, um, was uh, focused around me and the Safety Act. Uh, and, and they lost miserably uh, by 12 and a half points in the general election against me. And by the way, they did it, the same thing in the Chicago um, election in, uh, in the mayoral election recently. Um, making, you know, uh, uh, you know, suggesting that only one candidate is addressing crime. Actually, what we found out was that addressing crime in the ways that I've described is exactly what the voters want, which is short-term, medium-term, and long-term uh, addressing of crime, making sure that we have police on the streets, making sure that we're addressing poverty, making sure that we're addressing mental health and substance abuse treatment. Those are all things that are in the Safety Act. Great. Uh, Governor, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Emily. I'm a first year master's student here at the Kennedy School, a former Chicago resident and Cook County employee. Um, so having worked in social services in the public sector, um, I think that your investment in early childhood education um, and programs that benefit children overall has been fantastic. Uh, however, one agency I'm worried about and I think is probably among the more intractable problems in this state is DCFS. Um, so I'd like to know your thoughts on reforming it. Yeah. The Department of Children and Family Services in Illinois uh, is our child welfare agency. Um, and if any of you know anything about child welfare agencies, and you do, um, uh, this is, we're talking about, you know, these are the most vulnerable children. And they're the most vulnerable children in part because uh, they have parents who have mental health issues. And I'm, when I say issues, I mean significant mental health problems and significant substance use treatment problems. Those are just two major reasons why kids end up in the child welfare system. Uh, so addressing the problems that, that these children face requires a comprehensive solution. It's not just about, you know, how do we uh, you know, protect that child but also how do we change the dynamic of their, for their family and get them the help and treatment that they need. Um, when I came into office, DCFS was in terrible shape. Um, it would, had been for 20 years neglected. Uh, governors really didn't want anything to do with DCFS because every story that comes out of DCFS is a tragedy because nobody covers any of the good stories. They only cover the stories where somebody, you know, where something terrible happened. Um, and, uh, and I came into office, and because I've been involved with young children for, for a long, long time, um, and, and said, I'm going to stand with the Department of Children and Family Services to put the resources in and get the help that's needed. It is an intractable, so far difficult problem to overcome. 
however, importantly, what happened over 20 years is we, you know, the governors would appoint somebody to lead it, and then when they would get criticized a year, a year and a half into office, they'd replace them with somebody else, and then a year later, they replace them with somebody else, right? Somebody leading the agency. Um, I said, we're going to hire somebody great, and I'm going to stand up for them because every one of these tragedies needs to be addressed, but we need stability in the agency, and it isn't the leader of the agency, unless they really aren't running the agency well, uh, it isn't the leader of the agency, it's the things that go on in each of the divisions of the agency. So uh, this is a comprehensive problem, but let me just b broadly tell you, we, we have hired more uh, investigators, we've hired more uh, 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 people to help us with placements. We've invested more in uh, emergency beds and shelter beds and making sure that we have placements for uh, children who otherwise can't go back to their families. Um, and then importantly, we've engaged now the other agencies of government with DCFS in addressing the problem of the parents and the guardians of these children. Um, because that is fundamentally, you know, the, the, all of the science in this field says that kids are better off with their parents, their actual biological parents, if you can create a safe environment for them to be with them. But that you've got to help those parents uh, to be good parents. And so we're trying to do all those things. But the improvement's too slow for me. I'm impatient. Uh, and I continue to... Uh, work with the agency to, to get rid of the silos that exist uh, in social services so that we can address the parents better. Well, I'm afraid we're at time. Uh, Governor, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you.